Thank you for joining today's webinar on best governance and risk oversight practices. My name is Amanda Rock, and I'm the Communications and Social Media Manager for the National Conference on Public Employee Retirement Systems. Today's program is part of our Center for Online Learning, which provides remote continuing education to public pension trustees, staff, and other fiduciaries and stakeholders. In today's webinar, we will discuss broad oversight recommendations, as well as the tools and practices organized under a comprehensive risk management framework, including integrated asset liability modeling, stress testing, liquidity asset assessment, investment policy development, and ESG integration. Leading us in today's webinar are Julian Regan, Pam Dubuc, Maureen O'Brien, and John Ross from Siegel Markle. Marco Advisors. We encourage audience participation. Please submit questions by using the GoToMeetings portal. However, to ensure that we can cover all our topics, we will hold your questions to the last part of the program. Julian, I'll turn the webinar over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate and are privileged to collaborate with NCPERS on best governance and risk oversight practices. Uh, as we begin, I just wanted to uh, say a few words about uh, my colleagues who are kind enough to join us today and the portions of the presentation they'll be covering. Uh, if you're on slide two, uh, my colleague Maureen O'Brien is the, our colleague Maureen O'Brien is the head of our corporate governance group. Uh, she is a national expert on corporate governance and ESG integration. And of course, ESG integration is an important part of a risk management uh, framework, so Maureen will be speaking to that. John Ross uh, is the co-head of our risk management group, uh, also the head of our asset allocation group at Siegel Marco Advisors. Uh, if you believe, as I do, uh, the studies that tell us uh, that perhaps 80, maybe 90% of investment returns can be explained by asset allocation, uh, John is a pretty important person to have on the, uh, on the program today, so he'll be demonstrating asset liability modeling, uh, and other assessment tools under a risk management framework. Pam Dubuque uh, has expertise in a number of areas. Uh, today, she's going to focus on her expertise in key risk measures for public retirement systems with the understanding that these measures are particularly important to give board members a line of sight into new and changing risk exposures for alternative investments. So Pam will be speaking to key risk measures, which are one of the recommendations under NCPERS best governance practices. Just gonna slide, uh, uh, turn to slide four. And uh, Maureen and I were uh, pleased to be able to present uh, last May at NCPERS annual conference in Austin, Texas. And during that presentation, we reviewed some of the key capital market developments, challenges, and opportunities for public retirement systems. And that's a pretty good starting point for this presentation. Uh, after all, it's the market environment that argues in favor of having a stronger, more sophisticated set of tools to manage risk. So if we think about the story of public retirement systems uh, in today's date uh, and the capital markets, the story for public funds as shown on slide four uh, on the right-hand side of the table is, of course, strong asset growth. In the last decade, public fund assets have increased by approximately 68%, uh, ending the 2018 calendar year with $4.1 trillion in assets. And from another report that Maureen and I discussed uh, back at the annual conference, we know that public retirement system assets, when combined with their private sector defined benefit counterparts, account for approximately 42% of the U.S. retirement system's employer-sponsored plan assets. So public funds are a backbone, uh, a cornerstone of the United States retirement system, obviously managing risk and governing these, these important pillars of our retirement system uh, is a critical mission. We think about the story for public retirement systems in today's markets. It's a story of uh, more diversification in asset allocation structures, one could make the case that public retirement systems risks are diversified better than they ever have been. A part of that is because return assumptions, at least in the intermediate term, for public markets asset classes that have helped public funds achieve or exceed their return assumptions in the past are relatively modest due to low interest rates and relatively low inflation. So diversification 
is a strategy of necessity and public funds are executing on that effectively. But this story also means that new risk exposures are introduced into institutional portfolios, private equity, private credit, uh, hedge funds, other categories of alternative assets uh, require a strengthened risk management framework and public retirement systems really beginning on or about the time of the end of the financial system crisis, along with other leading financial institutions have been implementing best practices, uh, both internally and externally uh, on behalf of their members and beneficiaries. And again, that's what this presentation is all about. I'm gonna turn it over to Maureen, who's gonna talk a little bit about capital stewardship. Thanks, Julian. Um, so as we move to slide five, we're talking about two different kinds of governance today. Uh, fund governance, as Julian talked about at the top of the call, and also corporate governance, which relates to the companies that public funds invest in. So how well governed are those assets that you're um, putting with those companies? Uh, how well are they being safeguarded? Public funds and private pension funds own an estimated 17% of the U.S. equity market, uh, but they really have an outsized impact in terms of promoting good corporate governance at companies. Uh, the practices of companies are influenced by public funds who have been strong advocates in trying to uh, promote good governance through proxy voting and shareholder advocacy and a number of other means. And it's important to note that public and private funds also have a beneficial impact on how mutual funds promote good corporate governance through their stewardship. And of course, the driver for having an, uh, a program that promotes good corporate governance comes from research that shows that companies that are run with superior corporate governance expose investors to fewer risks in terms of their investment returns and can create more opportunities for stronger growth. Um, and I'll hand it back to Julian to discuss some of those items. Okay, thank you very much, Maureen. Turning to slide six, uh, I want to acknowledge right now that uh, we're going to be covering a number of topics, uh, more than a few technical terms in the presentation. So uh, for the audience, there's a glossary that includes a number of definitions. And one of them I'll start off with is a basic definition of governance uh, that I've always liked is the structures and relationships that drive organizational performance. Uh, and uh, the question can be asked, why do we want to focus so much uh, on these structures? And I think the answer is self-evidence, both from common sense, but also from studies and research that's out there that tells us that for organizations, whether it's a publicly traded company uh, or a retirement system, who have a commitment to practices such as strategic planning, uh, disciplined decision-making based on key risk and key performance measures that we're going to review shortly, uh, retirement systems that are focused on integrating asset and liability management. These organizations, these retirement systems, uh, are better positioned to perform not only within their investment portfolios, but across their administrative and operational functions for the long term for the member of beneficiaries and members. And of course, there's studies out there that substantiate this, as you can see at the bottom of page six, uh, a quote from a study that was done in 2008 of private sector plans uh, that estimated a better than 2% uh, investment performance premium for better governed private sector plans relative to their less well governed counterparts in the private sector. Uh, there have been other studies that have different numbers, uh, but it's pretty clear. Uh, private sector organizations, the conference board, for example, who studied this issue, for publicly traded companies that Maureen has discussed, uh, characterize best practices uh, as an internal effectiveness structure and tool to manage corporate risk. And that's what we're after. We want that tool to manage corporate risk. Going to page seven, slide seven that is. We made the point at the beginning of the presentation that financial institutions are implementing increasingly effective frameworks for managing risk as risk exposures change, especially coming out of the financial system crisis. What are some of these practices? Well, uh, certainly one commonly implemented practice or something that or a practice that's increasingly common is the concept of enterprise risk management. Now, ERM, as it's called, uh, is subject to uh, different definitions depending on the source. But the basic concept is to adopt a risk management framework that breaks down the silos that have traditionally existed in managing different categories of risk, market risk, operational risk, liquidity and credit risk, and to align risk management with the organization's long-term strategy. As you can see in the lower left-hand side of page seven, uh, 
uh, based on NCPER's most recent uh, study, the 2018 study, almost double the amount of public retirement systems reported adopting ERM in 2018 versus 2012. Another evidence of increased and improved transparency among public funds. You can see at the lower left-hand side of page seven, NCPER's survey finding that almost six in 10 public funds received the award for excellence and transparency and reporting from GFOA, an important benchmark. <clears throat> Additional evidence uh, of leading edge practices being implemented comes from another survey. On the lower right-hand side of the presentation, you can see some results from a survey of global public pension funds that BlackRock and the Economist Intelligence Unit uh, conducted back in 2018. These are multi-billion dollar funds, so there's some context there, but the multi-billion dollar funds are offering a good leading indicator of the direction of the industry. And you can see in this survey, uh, majorities of global public pension funds reporting in 2018 that they had recently amended their investment policies to incorporate documentation on enhanced risk analytics. Uh, Pam will be explaining those in a little bit. Uh, enhanced focus on fees, which really fun, runs through all best practice recommendations. Enhanced focus on asset liability management. Of course, that's something John will be demonstrating uh, with some great examples coming up. And of course, uh, to Maureen's earlier point, majorities of public funds globally are implementing ESG criteria. Just to elaborate a little bit on ESG, uh, of course, we know that ESG integration is a form of investment where the investor, whether it's an investment manager or a public pension fund, is considering in their asset selection decisions whether the asset or the security is contributing to an environmental good, such as clean water, a social good, job creation is a pretty good one, or is improving its governance. And you can see on the lower left-hand side of page eight, majorities of investment managers reporting to the CFA Institute in 2017 that they're now screening for these factors. Uh, so that's a pretty big development in our market. Uh, an interesting observation uh, that I've always uh, viewed as uh, very complementary to public retirement systems is that public funds do in part uh, to great credit to NCPERS, uh, to Maureen and her group and to others who work in the corporate governance movement have been focused on the G, better governance of portfolio companies uh, for decades, not years. Uh, I think we haven't always labeled proxy voting as ESG but it's a core tool for implementing ESG investing. Now, uh, as a setup to the best practice recommendations uh, that we worked with NCPERS to develop and release uh, back in May 29, I'm gonna turn it over uh, to John Ross to explain a little bit how public fund and other institutional investors' risk exposures are changing materially. And of course, this makes the case for a strengthened governance and risk management framework. I'm turning now to page 10. Great, thanks, Julian. Good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Um, so we've talked a little bit about ESG and the consideration for ESG becoming more prominent uh, and, and rightfully so. Um, additionally, changing allocation trends have also kind of been in the forefront of discussion over the past 10 years or so. And you, you can see on page 10 here, that trend uh, is documented in, in a couple of different studies looking at a 15-year snapshot and a more recent 10-year snapshot, pension fund allocations to alternative investments have pretty much tripled or so over the past 15 years or so, while allocations to some of the public market assets in terms of stocks and bonds have declined notably, say by about 15 or 20 percent. That's been driven by a couple of key factors, we believe. Um, one certainly is budget constraints at the uh, at the public level, um, being a headwind uh, uh, for plan assets, uh, and also looking for them, looking for the plans and the assets to uh, garner incremental returns in what really has been a lower return environment in public markets over the recent decade or so. So that's that's driven plan sponsors and driven uh, boards to increasingly look for opportunities outside of the public markets in non-public asset classes, and also driven the industry in general to create newer strategies in those same non-public markets that can provide either incremental return or reduced risk at the total portfolio level. So those, that notion of diversification benefits and new sources of return 
uh, uh, can be obviously beneficial to the plans, but it also introduces new challenges in the form of uh, m managing and monitoring different types of risk, perhaps, than we've seen in the past, depending on the asset class or the strategy. At this point, we, we would argue that public funds are, are better diversified than they've been, but face those new risks, which require perhaps a, a different, more sophisticated um, set of measurement and management tools. And that we think that'll continue, as you can see on page 11, uh, in terms of the trend in those asset allocation changes. Those changes in, in risk exposures, which can be kind of challenging to capture through some of the traditional modeling uh, that we've used in the, uh, in the industry in the past, form part of the rationale for public funds implementing new methods to define, measure, and manage risks, and for NCPERS best practices that we'll be reviewing uh, in the remainder of this presentation. With that, um, that kind of is a quick snapshot of the of the change in in uh, the private market segment. Let me turn it back to Julian to talk a little bit about some of the public market segments. Thank you very much, John. Very well stated. Uh, and if uh, somebody can make the statement based on what uh, John reviewed, uh, that. Uh, Today's asset allocation is not your grandmother's asset allocation or your grandfather's asset allocation. Uh, it's changed a lot. Uh, looking at page 12, which uh, describes some trends in the public equity market, the same can be said uh, of our public equity markets. Notwithstanding the fact that, that uh, public funds on average over the past decade, decade and a half, have reduced their public equity exposure uh, by perhaps 7.5% to 10%, which is a good thing, relying less uh, on the public equity market to get to a return assumption of 7.5% or whatever your long-term assumption is, that's good. Public funds and other institutional investors continue to have high exposures to equities, makes sense, but the equity markets themselves have new risks that we need to be aware of, need to solve for, and in some cases, there are risks that are still emerging. Uh, take, for example, indexing, uh, which is a management strategy in the equity markets that's been largely beneficial for public pension systems. We certainly recommend it for efficient asset classes. It helps clients to reduce costs in their public equity market, market uh, allocations as well as eliminate tracking error. But the sheer volume of assets as shown on the left-hand side of page 12 that has shifted from active management to passive management, those trillions of dollars have created a market where today, Perhaps if you believe, uh, if you look at the Morningstar data for public equity mutual funds, we have a market where perhaps 40% of, of equities are indexed. If we assume what's true of mutual funds is true uh, in the remainder of the market, whereas over 20 years ago, less than 5% of assets were passively managed. The volume of indexing and the fact that uh, index ETFs are also used in conjunction or index ETFs are used by short-term traders has raised concerns not only about uh, contributions of automated trading to market volatility, but also to impacts on corporate governance. Now, the corporate governance issue is one that Maureen and I have written about, have spoken about, and we'll revisit uh, going, f in, going forward. But you can see on the right-hand side that the, Fe the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston last year studied the issue uh, of index ETFs, and they concluded uh, that index ETFs at the level that they're employed in today's equity markets are in fact amplifying volatility to use the Fed's terms. To take it another step further, if you add to the 40% of trading that's driven by index funds, ETFs, uh, not ETFs, we've already covered those, of course, uh, algorithmic trading, high frequency traders, uh, at least one expert at JP Morgan Chase estimates that today only 10% of trading in the equity market is driven by traditional price discernment, fundamental analysis of company balance sheets, and there are those voices uh, in the fourth quarter of 28 who claimed that the volatility we experienced at the end of last year, which was the highest level of volatility since the financial system crisis, was really exacerbated by automated trading. So that's something we have to solve for. Now we're going to shift gears uh, to what is arguably the fastest growing risk exposure for institutional investors, uh, and Pam is going to speak a little bit about operational risk management. Great. Thank you, Julian. So broadly speaking, operational risk is the risk of loss due to 
inadequate or failed internal processes, people, or systems. So stated more simply, it's, it's the risk of a compliance failure. So we have a handful of operational risk types here on the right-hand side of the page, some of which public plans have been dealing with for decades and some of which are emerging given the changing landscape that we just discussed. So I'm just gonna focus on those that we feel are emerging. So as John had mentioned, we're seeing a significant increase in the amount of um, allocations that are going to alternative investments. And for those of you that have made alternative investments before, you know, you're aware that they often come with very lengthy legal documents, terms that are non-negotiable, uh, as well as assets that are hard to value. So they're opening up plans uh, to greater risk in the areas of legal and compliance, asset valuations, and, and by extension, financial reporting. Additionally, we have an increase in the uh, reliance on technology, which can open plans up to the risk of uh, cybersecurity breach or data loss, uh, which certainly can increase headline risk for plans. So given the implications of these risks, and, and as Julian suggested, we, we do view them as one of the largest growing risks to pension plans, we feel strongly that we really do need to cut across the silos of traditional uh, risk management framework and not just look at market, credit, and asset liability risk, but also uh, involve operational risk and in, into that, that framework. On slide 14, we have your actuarial risk, so the risk that one of your actuarial assumptions doesn't hold true. John is going to give you a few examples of ways to measure and monitor these risks a little later on in the presentation. That should really bring this to life. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to turn it back over to Julian <coughs> to review the NCPR's best practice recommendations. Thanks so much, uh, Pam. I'm going to skip ahead now to page 16 and uh, just uh, take a deep breath and reflect a little bit. Uh, back in 2012, uh, we were fortunate enough to collaborate with NCPRs to develop a set of best governance practices, which included, of course, risk oversight. And last May, uh, about a month and a half ago, uh, we updated those risk management or those governance recommendations to include a model risk management framework, which really can be taken by a public pension fund or any other institutional investor uh, and modified uh, to be used as their own risk management policy. The uh, component parts of that risk management framework are going to be largely the subject and the focus of the remainder of this presentation. But before we transition there, I wanted to first uh, review the best practices. Uh, the best practices really uh, build on the concept that if you take an abstract idea, governance is a pretty abstract idea, and you break it into pieces, you disaggregate it, that leads to better management. So in the spirit of that, uh, NCPERS best practices, which are on NCPERS website, and you can see the link to that at the bottom of page 16, uh, include uh, recommendations in the area of establishing governance manuals to have a centralized repository uh, for your governance documentation. That's something that uh, we certainly had in the public sector when I ran a retirement plan. Of course, I wasn't smart enough to call it a governance manual. I called it a binder, but it's a big enabler of effectiveness. We also have uh, a second category board practices, such as strategic planning, asset liability modeling that John is going to cover, board policies, uh, and we got good input from NCPERS governance advisor, global governance advisor, on the idea of including a whistleblower policy as a recommended uh, policy among your policy framework. That really ties back to minimizing the probability and severity of operational risk events that Pam discussed. And then, of course, risk oversight, strategic planning, measures and metrics, and, of course, stakeholder communications, which I've always thought public retirement systems really in our economy are probably the best uh, in terms of executing communications to members and beneficiaries, whether it's something that's required like the comprehensive annual financial report or your mission statement, great way to strengthen the confidence that your stakeholders, your members and beneficiaries have in the system and how it's being run. We switch to uh, slide 17. We know that a key enabler of managing risk, as we're going to elaborate on risk oversight, uh, is how effectively you can delegate risk management responsibilities to the different groups of experts, both on your staff, if you're a large system, and to your contracted service providers. Delegation is the name of the game uh, when it comes to risk management. Uh, a well-designed organization chart, well-designed policies, well-developed uh, contracts, will make it clear that the board who's responsible for risk oversight at the highest level is delegating day-to-day -day responsibility for management of market risk, in part at least, to investment managers who are buying and selling securities. 
delegating responsibility for transaction processing risk, for example, to your custodian bank, delegating shared responsibility for management of actuarial risk to your actuary. So that really is a starting off point. The risk management framework uh, that's in the updated set of best practice guidelines from NCPERS, again, builds on the concept that risk, like governance, is an abstract idea, and we can better execute on managing risk toward the end of reducing the probability and severity and lo of losses if we break the risk management program into four functional areas. Here we're breaking it into risk governance assessments, which John will cover measures and reporting. So I'm now going to elaborate uh, on a couple of different risk governance mechanisms. Uh, page 20, what is risk governance? Well, risk governance really involves defining the risks that you seek to manage and setting thresholds. In the area of categorizing risk, again, breaking risk into categories, that puts you in a better position to assign measures to different risks and to delegate uh, management responsibilities to the right groups. Uh, there's probably no one else on this call who spent a lot of time uh, surfing the internet, looking at the risk management policies and charters of some of our uh, big public companies and financial institutions, but I've done a little of that. And one of the commonalities in some of the best risk management charters you see there in the industry is that they really start in the second or third paragraph of their policies or charters by disaggregating risk, breaking it into categories here as we have market, liquidity, operational, and credit risk. Asset liability risk is defined in the footnotes. And when you go from one organization to the next, you may well have different definitions, and that's just fine. The idea, though, is to start with an effective risk management program. You want to define those risks. That's what we've done uh, in NCPERS risk management, model risk management framework that's on the website. Of course, uh, arguably the foremost tool, I'm on page 21, of risk governance is your investment policy at least for your investment program. Uh, for example, your risk, uh, your investment policy is the mechanism by which you document risk thresholds. So to use a pretty basic example, if you look at the left-hand side of page 21, in this hypothetical investment policy that's depicted in the middle of the page, uh, this board has set an upper bound threshold for equity market exposure at 55%. So if the board shows up at their July meeting or goes to their August meeting and the investment consultant hands them a report that shows that in aggregate, their equity managers have a 58% exposure to public equity markets, certainly possible with the uh, strong markets we've had recently. The board will know based on its policy to rebalance, to reduce the equity market exposure down to 50% or that neighborhood. And of course, rebalancing is a powerful, very important mechanism of risk management. Now I'm gonna turn it over to John, who's gonna talk about assessments, which really are used to surveil uh, risks and how they might change under changing assumptions. And I'll really leave it to John. He's the expert in this area. He's going to cover some ground here starting on page 22. Great. Thanks, Julian. So we've talked a little bit about investment policy and the importance of the components of that, especially as it relates to disaggregating risks. And that really is the, the, the guiding document to do so. We're, let's, let's now kind of take it another level in terms of defining risks and disaggregating risks at the plan level, but also identifying metrics that we can attach to those risks in a, in a framework. So on page 22, we have the assessments as Julian has mentioned, on the bottom half of the page, kind of identifying the specific risks within each of those assessment areas in terms of liquidity, asset liability modeling, stress testing, um, audits, which is an important component here as well, uh, making sure that we're uh, including any enterprise-specific metrics or or risk tolerances or preferences as a part of uh, as a part of a holistic uh, a holistic approach towards uh, strategic asset allocation. Uh, importantly, as well on the right-hand side, you can see investment manager due diligence, which is another form of assessment. That kind of is the is the follow-on to uh, typically is the follow-on to asset allocation and asset liability modeling. Once once any changes are identified, manager due diligence is an important component of that, especially as it relates to some of those alternative asset classes that we've talked about, where dispersion of returns is greater. Um, manager due due diligence is is even more important. 
So if we, if we use this framework and, and recognizing that the objective here is to enable boards to make informed decisions around strategic asset allocation with the best market data that we can garner, making sure that we recognize client specific metrics and sensitivities and do so in kind of a, you know, a repeatable framework that's consistent over time, but still flexible and still evolves over time as well. So taking that holistic approach, and, and I, I think it might be easy to consider this in, in three broad swaths, if you will. Where are we today from an asset allocation perspective in terms of either limitations or opportunities, given, given our current target allocation and given the market? Where might we go in the future in, under those same considerations in terms of asset classes, risk tolerances and preferences and, and changes in the market. And what are the implications of those potential changes or not? Um, both at the expected level in terms of market outcomes, as well as the outliers in terms of very good or very poor, uh, poor, poor market outcomes. The next several pages are, uh, are designed to be illustrative examples of some of the metrics uh, uh, looking at that kind of holistic framework from an asset liability modeling perspective. So let me, let me first focus on where are we today? And on page 23, you can see that uh, from a liquidity tier matrix example, that uh, what we've done here is basically disaggregate the plan assets by liquidity tiers in terms of daily, monthly, quarterly, uh, one to three, three to seven, and seven plus years. And by, by liquidity, we're, we're defining that as time to need. And what this does, as you can see, is it creates a, a, a bit of a mosaic where you can either identify overexposures to certain liquidity tiers or underexposures. In this case, you can see tier four and tier five, where we're, we're defining that as liquidity from one to seven years. Um, there is no exposure for this particular plan. So when we think about new asset classes, perhaps that's an opportunity set that, that we can incorporate uh, later on in the process. On the far right-hand side here on page 23, you can also see that we want to make sure we're incorporating future cash flows um, uh, from an asset class perspective. So private equity, where we have capital calls into the future, we want to make sure we're incorporating that. Page 24, moving ahead is a, is a similar snapshot, but again, incorporating future cash flows with consideration for liabilities as well. And on slide 25, focusing still on where are we today, we're now pulling in a what we refer to as a deterministic projection, which is simply uh, uh, the actuary's uh, form of assuming that their assumptions play out over, over a given time period, say 10 to 20 years. So the actuarial assumptions are projected to be achieved in each year. Um, think of it as a base case where we're, we're kind of creating a, uh, the baseline for the snapshot of the liabilities without um, the, the additional noise of having asset class um, uh, returns vary over time. So that, that deterministic projection creates the baseline scenario for the liabilities. On slide 26, now what we want to do is begin to incorporate um, variations in asset class returns, and that's what a stochastic projection will do. It essentially uh, generates 2,000 different economic scenarios in each year and corresponding asset class returns, varying inflation and interest rates for each of those 2,000 economic scenarios. The asset classes are correlated to those changes in, in interest rates and inflation, and that's what drives, in many ways, uh, changes to the asset class performance. What we do is we take those 2,000 observations and basically stack, rank them, um, represented by the, the, gray, the gray lines here, with the blue dot being the median outcome, and the darker gray and lighter gray, um, ranges of outcomes again within those within those 2000, 2000 scenarios and what we what we begin to capture here importantly is the impact of negative market outcomes as we've defined it as as you know downside risk in particular um, for the purposes of these types of analysis and it's those negative market outcomes that often drive and are more informative 
from a board decision making perspective necessarily than some of the some of the positive market outcomes. A rising tide raises all boats, um, but it's those it's those those lower tides and those negative market outcomes that we want to be be wary of. We looked at that uh, on slide 26 using the current target allocation, the current portfolio. If we want to consider new allocations on slides 27 and 28, we can, we can now incorporate new asset classes and move up and down the risk spectrum, if you will, um, and compare those, those static metrics to the current policy. Ultimately, what we want to do from a decision-making standpoint is compare those portfolios uh, to, this, to the current policy Again, in that dynamic um, framework or the stochastic projections, which are captured on slide 29. And again, 2000 scenarios focusing on, on some of the key metrics here in terms of contributions, economic cost, funded ratio, present value of contributions. But again, painting a picture here um, with a focus typically on, again, that downside, that downside risk management and beginning to quantify in actual dollars what those downside events in the future can mean for the plan. And those downside John, events can I, be... Yes, please, Julian. Well, if I could just jump in just for one second, just by way of uh, backing up for a second. All the tools that John is demonstrating, the key risk measures that Pam will speak to, uh, the risk governance mechanisms I cited, and uh, the ESG and corporate governance initiative that Maureen is going to be demonstrating at the end of this presentation, Every single one of those, just to make this point, maps back to one or more of the seven sets of recommendations in NCPERS best governance practices, which is on page 16, just to make that point, uh, and also is on NCPERS website. So you'll find them all in there in the Word document as well as on page 16. Sorry to interrupt you, John. Uh, let me know where you want me to go now with the slides. No worries, Julian. Thank you. Um, slide 30, lastly, uh, we talked about stress tests examples and there's a couple different ways you can capture that first uh, as as indicated here on slide 30 basically creating specific market outcomes that are defined by the user either by 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 the client or by the consultant or some combination of the two to to create a different uh, specific economic scenario so that you can again monitor and measure different portfolio outcomes and compare them against each other um, we should mention that stress testing is also a part of that downside um, risk assessment as part of the stochastic analysis. Uh, those those negative market outcomes are also stress, um, you know, stress test events, if you will, that again vary interest rates and inflation scenarios. So let me stop there and turn it back over to Julian uh, to now lead us into some of the measures from a from a key performance and risk measurement perspective. Okay, just a quick point. Uh, thank you very much, John, on key risk measures. Again, we've covered risk governance as one component of the risk management framework. John took us through uh, different types of assessments. Of course, uh, there are others that uh, we don't have time to cover, like your audit and investment manager due diligence that uh, John just mentioned. Key risk measures, the concept behind having a limited set of key risk measures, which is one that's been around for a while and one of the best practices, uh, recognizes the reality uh, that boards of trustees don't have the time uh, to sift through thousands of different measures and thousands of pages of reports to evaluate whether or not the retirement system is funding, is, is progressing toward the goals that have been set, and is staying within risk thresholds. We need a limited set of measures. Uh, Pam is going to describe these. Uh, I will give you one anecdote from my uh, experience working in the risk management industry uh, where I learned a hard lesson. Uh, some number of years ago, I was on a risk management team that was tasked by executive management of our company to identify a, a set of key risk measures for executive management. But we came back with a set of over a thousand measures. Uh, obviously, that's completely contrary to the concept of having limited measures. As you'd expect, uh, we were sent back down to the basement uh, to do a little more work, which is what we did. So I'm going to turn it over to Pam on slide 32 to kind of bring to life how key risk measures work. Great. Thank you very much, Julian. So here we do have some examples of how to measure risk in your traditional asset classes. And some of these tables and charts may look familiar. I'm sure your investment consultants and investment managers have provided similar data to you. 
On the left-hand side of the page, we have examples of historical performance-based risk and return metrics. So a few that we, we like to look at are standard deviation, sharp ratio, tracking era, area, and, and beta, um, along with the, there are a few others listed here that can be helpful to quantify risk. We also want to take a look at the portfolio holdings-based characteristics, which really drills into the diversification in the portfolio. You want to make sure that your risks aren't concentrated in any one area. You also want to make sure that the risk is consistent with your investment policy statements and the investment guidelines that you've put in place with the manager. Uh, so one quick example here, looking at the fixed income sector distribution chart on the bottom right of the page. Here, uh, this particular manager is significantly underweight U.S. Treasuries and overweight mortgage-backed securities. You know, it is an active manager. We would expect it to look different than the benchmark. That's what they're being paid for. Uh, we just want to make sure that, you know, that that level of mortgage-backed securities is commensurate with what's in their guidelines and that we understand their risk. And lastly, while it's important to look at your investment managers individually, we also need to look at them in total to make sure that at a plan level you don't have any unintended overexposure in any one area. And we also have uh, risk exposures and alternative asset classes. Julian, if you'll flip the next slide. Um, this is an area that we think is uh, increasingly important given the increase in allocations to alternative investments, but also the illiquidity in this area. You want to make sure you really understand what's in your portfolio today before you go ahead and make another commitment to an investment that may lock up capital for another 10 years. So similar to traditional portfolio, you here want to look at diversification as a key factor in measuring risk. You want to make sure you're diversified by strategy, vintage year, uh, as well as region. Another important measure is your unfunded commitment or the amount that you're legally bound to fund to these investments. So looking in the middle on the left-hand side of the page, you know this particular private equity portfolio has a call ratio of 0.59. So they, they funded about 60% of their commitments to date. They still have $205 million left in unfunded commitments. And as John mentioned earlier, when he was going through the liquidity tier analysis, this is a factor that would be taken in to that when, when uh, looking at the liquidity at your total plan level. And lastly, leverage is another important measure of risk, particularly as we navigate the uncertain market ahead. You know, leverage can certainly uh, serve to compound good returns, but it, it can also, uh, when they are negative, it, it can serve to compound that poor performance as well. Um, so we just want to make sure, you know, there's varying levels of, of, of leverage used depending on the risk of the strategy. You want to make sure that you understand that risk and that the manager is using a, a, a level of leverage that's commensurate with the risk that they're taking. And again, here, you just want to also um, look at the total portfolio level as well and not just the individual pieces. Okay, thank you, Pam. Uh, we've covered now uh, governance assessments and measures. Uh, the next two slides are in reporting, which is the fourth component of the risk framework. Uh, I think in the interest of time, Maureen has got a couple of, uh, one in particular, very powerful example of how proxy voting and corporate governance and NCPERS recommended practice can be used uh, to manage risk in your public equity portfolio. So just going to note on slides 34 and 35 that reporting uh, is really the mechanism by which you bring everything together, the assessments, your key measures, and reports obviously from across uh, your risk exposures and functions. So, uh, Maureen, if it's okay with you, I'm going to turn it to slide 36 and uh, really look forward to hearing you talk about this anecdote uh, from the world of corporate governance and proxy voting as it relates to the subject today. Great. So, before we get into that, just another reminder that ESG, which for a long time was more of an abstract concept, has really matured and is, um, lends itself to a practical set of tools to implement ESG as part of your um, approach to risk for your plan. And really, it's the goal is to position funds for risk-adjusted returns that focus on investments whose values could be enhanced by better performance on social, environmental, and governance aspects. Uh, we have broken it down to four implementation tools. The first is the investment policy statement, so discussing ESG as part of that approach to your fund. Uh, the second is proxy voting, making sure you understand how those votes are being cast and that they're being cast in the interest of your plan participants. Uh, the third piece is shareholder engagement, and that's where I'm going to give you a very tangible example of how some funds are doing more than just proxy voting, but they're actually reaching out to companies that they're invested in to make sure that they have the right policies and internal controls in place. And finally, that last piece is manager selection. So when you are conducting due diligence on those managers, getting more in-depth in how those managers approach ESG. 
So Julian, can you flip to slide 37 and we'll um, get into the particular example for today. Great, so uh, there are 54 investors, including Siegel Marco advisors that are working in a coalition uh, called Investors for Opioid Accountability. And the group represents many public pension funds and you can see those listed here out on the slide in front of you. Uh, what happened is we've, the funds have been seeing the opioid epidemic impact our economy and impact uh, death rates for our country and the life expectancy rate. But as investors, this is also having financial consequences because the companies that are part of the opioid supply chain are being sued uh, throughout the country. There's about 1,900 lawsuits pending against companies that manufacture opioids, distribute opioids, and then provide opioids at the retail pharmacy level. And those lawsuits and the company's approach to navigating this crisis has impact for returns from these companies, which are um, big companies that you likely all hold shares in. Um, can we move to the next slide, Julian? So this group formed to engage companies on how they are responding to the opioid crisis. And we looked into the corporate governance of these companies and what they were doing in terms of assessing their impact on the crisis and the risk that they were exposing investors to as the crisis began to spiral out of controls and these companies were caught a little short-footed. Uh, this group has filed a total of 33 proposals asking companies to improve governance around the issue. And we've had uh, pretty good success through these um, in-depth conversations with companies. I'll point to just uh, one, one issue here, which is a board risk report. So it's a request from these investors to the companies asking them to issue risk reports uh, available on their website that detail the company's um, role in the supply chain for opioids and what they have done to have better board oversight of what's happening and better awareness of the impacts and changes they can make to mitigate their, um, their role in the crisis. So we've seen all of the companies that distribute opioids, McKesson, Amerisource, Bergen, and Cardinal Health have all issued those reports, as have a number of the companies that manufacture opioids. You can go to their websites and look at those reports now. Um, now, this, of course, benefits the investors that have engaged these companies because it sets the companies up to um, navigate through this crisis and, um, and make all the right decisions so that those investments in those companies are uh, better over the long term. Of course, it helps the entire shareholder base as well. And in that sense, that's why public funds and other funds that do the shareholder engagement have an outsized impact in making sure that governance for the U.S. public equity market as a whole performs better. Um, so if we move to the next slide, we're going to leave you with some key takeaways today from the presentation, and then we'll leave a few minutes at the end for your questions. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to um, the second to last bullet, which is just Again, to restate the point that ESG integration should be considered as a risk management tool. It helps set your fund up to uh, take a deeper dive into some of these issues that can have a large impact on your return. Um, and Julian will make a few more points on the key takeaways and then we'll open it up for your questions. Thanks so much, Maureen. That really is a uh, powerful example. Uh, just a uh, couple of parting comments. Uh, a term that I hear people use a lot these days is, wow, that was a lot. Um, I would say that if you look at this presentation, uh, I hope it had a lot. I hope it had a lot of useful information uh, for folks who are on the call or who might listen to this later on. As a uh, practical matter, if you're looking at the best governance and risk oversight practices as a toolkit, uh, and that's what I really think they should be used for, if you go to page 16, that's where the summary of the recommendations is in summary form. And of course, on NCPER's website, there's a link. Uh, the recommendations, the guidelines are uh, laid out in seven, di seven different sections, and the model risk management framework is also written out uh, in the document. So we know today that public pension funds have uh, generated strong asset growth, uh, contributing significant to our economy, 
a backbone really of the U.S. retirement system and really playing a leadership role in implementing new uh, and innovative ways to manage risk and govern their operations across both the investment function, but also importantly, member services and the operational function for the benefit of members and beneficiaries. And that's really what this presentation is all about. Uh, we've appreciated the opportunity. And Amanda, if you want us to take a question or two, uh, we're obviously happy to do that. Okay, thank you guys for the presentation. I think we have time for a few questions. Um, first one is, what are some of the pitfalls boards should avoid while they are working on strengthening their governance and risk management practices? Okay, Amanda, if you don't mind, I'm going to take that one and maybe let someone jump in as somebody who's experienced a couple of pitfalls. Uh, one of the pitfalls is that you over-engineer governance in your quest to try and strengthen uh, the fund's position. What do I mean by that? Well, you can have too many policies. Uh, you can also have guidelines around asset allocation, for example, that are so tight that you take discretion from the board. Uh, that's not what good governance is all about. Good governance is all about giving some flexibility uh, to the board uh, and management, uh, but also setting up that internal effectiveness structure that the folks at the conference board alluded to in the quote uh, we reviewed at the beginning of the presentation. So don't want to over-engineer it. Don't want to have it be overly aspirational. Want it to be practical, practical uh, and, uh, and actionable. Julian, this is John. I might, I might add to that um, from practical experience as well. Um, oftentimes boards will recognize the importance of risk management, um, but overlook the need for a nimble, a nimble decision-making process, right? Oftentimes, um, making decisions around either either uh, altering investment policy statements or once the investment policy statement has been set, trying to change uh, um, uh, whether it's asset allocation changes or, or, or manager review implications within the policy itself. Oftentimes that decision making process is not um, is not quite as nimble as would be as would be uh, most beneficial. So recognizing that you, you might need to think about process as well as content from a, from a decision-making standpoint. Okay, anyone else? <laughs> All right, our last question, how can a medium-sized or modest-sized retirement system adopt the governance and risk management tools that larger retirement systems with greater accesses, access to resources are adopting? All right, I'll uh, take a shot at that one as well. Uh, you know, I think a pretty good example of that question would be chief risk officer roles. So um, a $100 billion plus state retirement system, and plenty have done this, uh, have hired chief risk officers to centralize risk management uh, to, as Pam was saying, break down the silos uh, in managing different categories of risk. Uh, if you're a medium-sized pension fund, you know the budget to hire a chief risk officer. So you can accomplish the equivalent outcome by working with your service providers, your actuary, your consultant, your executive director, uh, your advisors uh, to create a reporting protocol that brings reporting on all of those risks together and really gives you the, the equivalent of a chief risk officer uh, without the budget, uh, without having to staff a position. That's the best example I can think of. Okay. Uh, thank you, Julian, Pam, Maureen, and John for your presentation, and thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to hosting you at the next In Secrets webinar. Right. Thank you, Amanda. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.